Good morning again. It's good to be back with you. One person missed me. I am so thankful. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I, several people have said that they missed me. Uh, I'm just playing. I am. I really am glad to be back. I, I'm thankful for the time to go and celebrate my daughter's graduation, or our, my wife and I, not just mine. Why do I say things? Why? I'm going to encourage you to turn in your Bibles with me so we can go right to where we're supposed to be. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 this morning. Chapter 3 verses 6 through 10 is the goal today. And uh, I want to get started back into the book of 1 Thessalonians. You can see that the title there is I Can't Live Without. And I, I left this as an incomplete sentence to kind of let you fill in the blank. What would you put in there? Food. All right. You can't live without food. Yes. That's good. I would actually say, there's actually some of my notes there. Uh, Some of us might say we couldn't live without cheeseburgers, brisket, pulled pork. You know what, though? I was in the Northwest this last weekend, and let me tell you something. You don't know fish and chips until you've had some halibut, beer-battered halibut. Yes, I said the word beer from the pulpit, but it's, it's not alcoholic. It's just the batter. Anyway. If you haven't had halibut, white flaky halibut with just really, you know, French fries so hot they burn your mouth. You have not had seafood. Don't call your catfish seafood, okay? That's lake (laughs) lake food. And here's another one, okay? Now, this is differences between the Northwest and South. In the Northwest, you have donut shops too, okay, which is good. You have donut shops down here, right? We all like our donuts. But you don't have in the South, we don't have here in the South, Bacon-covered maple-glazed bars. In fact, maple bars are even hard to find here. Have you had maple bars, anybody? So many of you do not know the wonderful thing called maple bars. And and since most of you don't even know what a maple bar is, you don't even know about the bacon-covered maple bar. But you don't know. If you were up in the Northwest, you might be like me and kind of be down here going, I go to the donut store, I'm looking for a maple bacon bar, and they're not here. I still survive, though. But you know what? I got, now, in all fairness, I'm not dog in Texas, okay? All right. But you go up to the Northwest and go to a donut shop, and you, want, you might want a little protein with your donut, right? I, The pigs in a blanket thing or kolaches, whatever we call them down here, those are good. You can't find them in the Northwest. You ask for a pig in a blanket or a kolache and they're like, what? (laughs) I'm telling you, some uncultured people in both places, it's just. (laughs) But you know what? We can live without food, Uh, certain foods. We can survive with other food. Maybe you put in there, maybe there's some romantics out in the room that would say, I can't live without you. Love, as my son so eloquently put it. There's a a, a scene from a movie. I didn't even see the movie. Let's see if you've seen this. You complete me. Some of you think you can't live without love, live without your spouse. That's true. That's good. You shouldn't be wanting to live without your spouse, okay? Maybe you can't live without mom or dad. Uh, maybe you can't live without breathing. Maybe it's a health thing like that. Maybe, it's, maybe you can't live without your right arm if you're right-handed, left arm if you're left-handed. Maybe you... You can't live if you couldn't walk, talk, see, or hear. 
Now, some of these things range in importance, don't they? Uh, whether they're important things or not, we, we realize there's a lot of things we can live without. And we say things like, I can't live without this, because we're expressing how much we love something or someone, or how much affection we have towards someone or something. Today, we're going to look at what the Apostle Paul can't live without. And perhaps we will develop similar affections. Paul, who is writing this letter along with Silas and Timothy, he's writing just after Timothy is, has returned to him and the missionary team. Timothy had come from Thessalonica back to the missionary team after being sent there at risk to the work being done with Paul and the missionary team because they were so greatly worried about the church, the people of God at the place called Thessalonica. So Timothy was sent to them. He had just come back. And we find here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, that it says, and we'll, let's read 6 through 10 right now. It says, but now Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news about your faith and love. He reported that you always have good memories of us and that you long to see us as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and affliction, we were encouraged about you through your faith. For now we live if you stand firm in the Lord. How can we thank God for you in return for all the joy we experience before our God because of you as we pray very earnestly night and day to see you face to face and to complete what is lacking in your faith? May God bless the reading of his word. And would you pray with me as we start this sermon this morning? Father, we, we come to you this morning and we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for your good character. We thank you for this day we get to celebrate moms and, and Lord, children and the idea of this parent and baby dedication. And God, as we come to your word, it's, it's more than just a day we focus on moms. It's a day we focus on you most of all. And so I pray wherever we are, whoever we are, that you would speak to us through your word. Pray you would help me to speak faithfully and clearly and accurately. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would move in us, cause us to believe, cause us to act in faith and obedience to you. We thank you for your goodness and we thank you for your word. Be magnified now in the time of preaching. And we pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's go back and start unpacking verse 6 a little bit. Verse 6 starts out saying, But now Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news about your faith and love. So he begins with this, but now. You see, because before, they were very concerned about their faith even surviving. They were worried about the church surviving all the persecution and the attacks that they were enduring. And so Timothy was sent concerning their faith. He was sent to strengthen and encourage them. But now, Timothy's back. Timothy has brought a good report. Timothy has returned to them. There's such a deep concern and care for the church that there is uh, this, this person sent to them to support and encourage, and now he's come back with the report. And this word good news is good word. By the way, it's the word we use for the gospel. Remember, you've heard the word the gospel means good news. It's the same word that's used here that Timothy has come back and he brought the gospel with, us, with him. But he's not saying the message about salvation in Jesus specifically here. He's just saying the way the word was used in those days. This is a really good report. We're so thankful. But it's rare for the Apostle Paul to use this word in any other context than the scripture so he is making a huge point about how good of news this was to receive, that they were not only surviving but thriving in the faith. Very, very good news. What a relief it must have been for Paul to hear Timothy's report that the church family in Thessalonica was doing well, pursuing Christ in their faith despite all the hardships going on around them. But he, he gives a report and he says the report, the good news was about their faith and love, specifically about their faith and love. And when we think about the Christian life, faith and love are essentials 
They're essential fruits of the Christian life, the Christian faith. Faith is about our confidence in the Lord Jesus, our reliance upon who he is, upon his salvation, his grace, walking with him. And so the church, they were saying, or Timothy was saying to this missionary team that they're continuing on trusting Christ as they assemble together and serve together. They are continuing on in the faith. And faith is something we practice together, just as this church was practicing their faith together, living it out together. And he mentions their love. The love is an outworking of the Spirit of God in someone's life. In a church's life, it's love that is expressed for God, love that is expressed for one another within the fellowship, and it's love for those in the Thessalonian community at that time, and for us in our community today, if we practice the love that should be coming out of Christ's followers, but also it's their love for Paul and the missionary team. And not believing lies of the enemy that might come in and say, you know, that guy came in and stirred up a lot of trouble. You shouldn't be so friendly with him. You shouldn't love him so much. They could have thought Paul was the problem. Things were going just fine until Paul showed up in town. But they didn't. They loved Paul. So faith and love go together. Trusting and walking with God will produce a love for God and for others. Love is a fruit of the Spirit. Have you ever heard that in, in Galatians? Love is a fruit of the Spirit. It's the first one listed. The fruit of the Spirit is love. So it means that, that not we manufacture it from within, but as we walk with Christ, one of the fruits that we bear by being connected to the Spirit of God is love. God-like love. Commitment to one another, seeking others' best interests and even being affectionate with others. And this all took place in spite of difficult circumstances. And, and it's interesting, difficult circumstances produce different results for different people. For some, difficult circumstances cause people to turn on each other and become hostile and bitter towards each other. But because this was a godlike love, their love allowed them to build one another up. So as he continues in verse 6, he says that he, Timothy, reported that you always have good memories of us and that you long to see us as we also long to see you. You always have good memories of us. So the things that the Thessalonians thought of when they thought of Paul and the missionary team were positive, uplifting, upbuilding thoughts, good memories Even though those times were difficult, riddled with risk, they think of the time as good. Isn't that fascinating? Do you look back at the the most difficult seasons of your life and the people that were involved then and think of them with the highest regard? Do you think of them as good memories? This is what they're saying about Paul and, and the missionary team, but probably most of all because they had come to know Jesus during that time. They had experienced the washing away of their sins, the weight of their guilt falling away, the joy of being known and loved. You ever felt like you were loved, but the person didn't really know you and you were afraid if they got to know you, they'd stop loving you? Well, God loves you and knows you. Yeah. You could even say wow on that one. Yeah. But there's not a time. And notice the word always in there. And if you're around me for any length of time, you know that I'm very conscious of words like never and always. And he says always. So that means every time. There was not a time that Timothy heard them bring up a negative memory. There was always good when they thought of Paul and talked of Paul. It was a good thing. And they said that that you long to see us just as we long to see you. There was this ongoing, consistent desire to reconnect to uh, in person. And the feelings were mutual between the church and the missionary team. There is a special bond of love that God had produced in them. But I just want to point this out. Point number one this morning is living out faith and love. So just practicing these, these elements of the faith that is that are produced in us by the Lord as we walk with him, living out faith and love, serves a refreshing message. 
living it out. It's amazing how people receive that. It's like cool water after mowing the lawn. Man, I tried, guys. I, I'm trying to make points that you understand. You got to nod and, and say amen a few more. I need a little help. I, I mowed my grass yesterday. No, I weed-eated my grass. My wife mowed. But I'm te- I was dripping. I don't know what was. I have a disease. Something was pouring off my body the whole time. It was crazy. And it wasn't even all that hot. But I'll tell you, the cool water afterwards didn't just go in my mouth. But it was refreshing and nice. And it's seriously, it, there's, a, there's a welcomeness to that cool water after exercising, being out in the heat for, you know, doing hard work for a while. It's, it's refreshing to your body. But when we live and practice faith and love, it's refreshing to the soul. And I can tell you, I just took a week off and went to Oregon and came back and it's encouraging to get a good report about the church. Do you know? It's encouraging. Now, when, when I come back and people go, oh man, service was awful and, and, and the preaching was so poor and I'm like, I can't ever leave again. But that's not what I heard from y'all. Thank you. Even if you thought it. No, I'm just kidding. Don't, don't, don't go there. No, that was, oh. Alex, I thought you did a great job, man. And I'm not just saying that. Stick to the notes. <laughs> Living out faith and love is a refreshing message to those who have invested in the work. But living out faith and love also serves as a refreshing message to the unbelieving world around us. When we function as spiritual people who have received the grace of God, when we live relying on and persuaded that Jesus is king, when we love like God loves, the unbelieving world gets a taste of what it really hungers for. And they are invited into that family. Can I just remind you that the fruit of the Spirit is love? Can I remind you what love is like? I I think sometimes we, we should go back to familiar passages. 1 Corinthians 13, known as the love passage. Good job. Just, let's just read verses 4 through 7 of 1 Corinthians 13. Let's t- maybe talk briefly about each one. Love is patient. How many of you want me to stop and move on to the next part? <laughs> love is patient. The love that, that we have for one another that God is producing in us, whether with our brothers and sisters in our congregation, brothers and sisters in another congregation, or even neighbors out in the community, whether they're friendly or unfriendly, whether they drive well or don't, whether they play by the rules in baseball and softball or don't. Hmm? Mm. Love is patient. It, it endures, wait, that's another one that it tells us in a minute. Let me not get ahead of myself. Love is patient. Love is kind. Hmm. Are we kind? Love does not envy. See, it's not insecure. It's not afraid that God would love others more than us because God loves richly each one of us. So to see someone else do well, we don't need to envy them. We give thanks for them. Love is not boastful. And if, that, if you weren't getting the picture, it's also not arrogant. It doesn't talk about how good it is or how good you are. It's, it's not arrogant. It doesn't go, well, I'm this and that, and I have all this and that. It's not boastful, not arrogant. It's not rude. 
seems like if love is kind, we would know that it's not rude. But Paul, who writes this, tells us both. It's not self-seeking. It's not irritable. And does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It means it it, it embraces when God exposes sin in us or even exposes sin in others. We don't rejoice in the unrighteousness or the sin that has taken place, but we rejoice in truth, allowing that confession to be the truth exposed. That's love. It bears all things. <sighs> that word all. How many of us can bear some things? How many of us feel like we can bear all things? Oh, <laughs> mm. There's some people that we love and we try to love and they continually hurt us and hurt us over and over and and we just want to go, mm, I've, my love capacity is done. But no, bears all things, believes all things. How often does our love not want to believe what someone is saying or that they could even be somebody that doesn't seem like they could ever be? But love believes all things. Love hopes all things. It has a confident expectation and it endures all things. That's just three verses on the concept of God-like love. So when we live that out, it's a refreshing message. Verse 7 says, therefore, back to 1 Thessalonians, Chapter 3, verse 7, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and affliction, we were encouraged about you through your faith. For now we live if you stand firm in the Lord. He says, therefore, this is because Timothy brought such good news about your, your faith and love that we were encouraged. That's awesome. Thank you. We were encouraged about you through your faith. This word encouraged is the Greek word parakaleo, which parakaleo is the verb form of what we call the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the comforter, the encourager, the consoler. So the the word that he's saying, by your your love for us, your your faith continuing on, it was such a a comfort and encouragement. It's like what the Holy Spirit is and who he, he is and what he does for us in our souls. To see this is such an encouragement. This good news ministered deep in their soul as a refreshing message. And the encouragement, you'll notice, comes in all our distress and affliction. You see, they left distress and affliction behind for the Thessalonians, but it didn't just stay there. Distress and affliction continued with Paul and the missionary team. And he says, in despite of what we were going through, we were encouraged by you. What a blessing. And I I got thinking, have you ever noticed how pain seems to pile on? You know, mentally, emotionally, um, as these missionaries continued to face persecution and hardship as they moved on from one place, and and you think maybe sometimes it just would get easier to keep doing what God has called you to do. Have you ever thought that? I'm doing what God has called me to do. This shouldn't be hard. But it is. And there's a lot of obstacles And then the obstacles surprisingly come from not the outside world sometimes, but it comes from our brothers and sisters in the church. And and we get discouraged. And then as we get discouraged, we think about the other things that we've done and we go, oh, but they're not succeeding either. And so I'm a failure in that. And what we see is pain likes to pile on in our mind. I imagine the missionaries could have gone down that road that nothing seemed to be going right. Everyone's suffering because of our message. It's not being received. We, we experience pain in some aspect and c- continue to find more. And it, like it's just piling on. What is going on? 
And so in this time of not knowing, while they were sending Timothy, waiting for Timothy while he was there in Thessalonica, those missionaries could have gotten more discouraged or depressed, could have, but he brought back a good message. See, we, we're inclined to interpret silence as another grief or loss or failure, but their faith encouraged the missionaries. They were comforted, called to a deeper trust in Christ. As they saw his faithful work in his church. See, the Lord loves his church and cares for his church more than we do. And he will take care of it. And it's through that church's faith that such encouragement took place. So I just want you to know, church, that our living faith has the capability of encouraging others. And it may be in ways you never even know. But then Paul says, in in kind of conclusion to this expression of joy and encouragement, he says in verse 8, For now we live if you stand firm in the Lord. This is the, the exclamation of this passage. It is the hyperbole of how encouraged they were. It's like saying, I can't live without this. And this is that you stand firm in the Lord. Paul's saying, I can live, we missionaries can live and breathe and continue on if you stand firm in the Lord. In other words, like, we would die if we found out you weren't standing firm in the Lord. Now, again, it's hyperbole. He's overstating to make the point that this matters. Paul's life is so invested in serving the Lord by building up his church that for someone, for the people there in Thessalonica to not continue in the faith would feel like death. See, Paul lives to build up the church in the faith. He says, stand firm in the Lord. He lives because they stand firm in the Lord. It reminds me actually of your message last week, Alex. Ephesians 6.13 says, For this reason, take up the full armor of God. For the reason being, not that we fight against flesh and blood, but against powers and authorities in high places, and ultimately evil is our enemy, not, not our brothers and sisters, not the people and the neighbors in our next door or around our community. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand firm. To stand firm is to continue in a state. It's unmoved, unshaken, to hold one's ground steadfast. And God wants you to stand firm firm and not be shaken by the challenges and afflictions of life. But he wants you to rely on his strength and to use the armor that he's provided and the weapons he's provided, which are his strength. And I won't re-preach your message because you did a good job, but let's put on the armor of God and rely on his strength and stand your ground. Point number two this morning is this, you are not fully living unless you're living fully for the Lord. Ongoing, consistent practice of faith is the standing firm in the Lord. And it will be in spite of persecution or affliction. It will be in spite of life's discouragements or distractions. But are your desires in life changing to the things that God desires. How did that song put it? I will wait for you until my soul is satisfied. To be satisfied in the Lord God. Are we willing to wait for that or do we go, I'm not satisfied right now, so I'm going to go do something to meet that need instantly. But I I urge you to continue to wait on the Lord for full soul satisfaction. He gives water that will cause you to never thirst again. But the fullness of that may not be realized till we're with him in heaven. 
And it's a hunger and a thirst that we have to continue going to him for our satisfaction. But we have to fully live for him because we're not fully living if we're not. Fullest life comes in Christ even while we're at war. Not with flesh and blood again, but against evil, against the enemies of God. And for Paul and this missionary team, they weren't fully living if the people that they ministered to weren't fully living for the Lord. That's, that assumes that they themselves were living fully by fully living for the Lord because their desires were what the Lord desires. And what the Lord desires is for them to stand firm and, and to keep growing. And they saw that and were encouraged by that. So they were living fully. And many of us in our time and era, we spend a lot of time and money pursuing things that will not make us happy. There's a lot of promises that it'll make us happy. Look at the commercials. The children are smiling at Disney World. But I've never been. Well, I guess I was once as a two-year-old, but I don't remember that. Everyone I've ever heard come back from Disneyland is like, we went on three rides because it was two-hour wait for each, and it was $5,000 to eat dinner, and it was just, we, we got through it, man. Right? The promise of Disneyland is like, oh, family vacation is going to be awesome. Hallelujah. But the reality is, man, my feet hurt, it cost me a fortune, I'm going to take a year to pay it off, and the kids didn't really have a good time. In fact, they argued with us and were disrespectful, and sounds like a good time. <laughs> the world lies to us. So let me encourage you, give yourself fully to the Lord. He gave himself fully for you. And it's an act of faith. Continually, persistently walking with the Lord, standing firm in the faith. Verse 9 says, how can we thank God for you in return for all the joy we experience before our God because of you? As we pray very earnestly night and day to see you face to face and to complete what is lacking in your faith, Paul asks a rhetorical question with an obvious answer how can we thank God for you? We can't because we're just so joyful for the, the, the encouragement, the joy that we have in our fellowship with you. It's so good. We just can't thank God enough. Do you feel that way about your brothers and sisters in Christ? Have you ever been on a mission trip and, and served a church that was just so grateful and, and so sweet that when you leave, you're like, man, I wish I could be around them more He's just saying we're so thankful to God for you. The total question of 9 and 10 simply communicates Paul, Silas, and Timothy feel that they've benefited from the relationship with the church in Thessalonica even more than the church did. And it could be argued that the church benefited more. But it was for their joy, for their encouragement. So they ask, how can we give back as much as we have received? This kind of relational joy takes persistence, though. Patience, all those things we talked about of love. Can I just encourage you, church family, don't quit on church family relationships. Don't quit just because it seems right to you. Don't, don't go to the next church down the street to avoid your problems with people here. Let's talk to people, not about them. And if you need support from pastors and deacons, you have a church with pastors and deacons who will support you. And we will have necessary hard conversations to work through conflict to bring us to a place of health. My prayer is that the church family at Lakeside would experience the same joy with one another as we grow in faith and love. But if we quit when it gets hard, we won't experience what he's talking about here. And by the way, if you haven't experienced it yet, it's going to get hard sometimes. The person sitting next to you might just drive you crazy. Don't look too hard right now. Come on. <laughs> the person up here just might drive you crazy. Hey. <laughs> you know, amen means let it be. <laughs> You could say that's right. That might be right, but okay. All right, anyway. But hey, 
They plead with God to see the Thessalonians face to face on a daily basis, night and day, in a sense because they want to give back the same encouragement that they've received to the church in Thessalonica. He says, before our God, which means it's during their times of prayer for the Thessalonians as they're in the presence of God, not just a momentary recollection or or memory. They're like, before God, we think of you and we give thanks for you and we plead for you. And so we, we want to be with you and see you face to face. We pray earnestly for that. And and this prayer of thanksgiving for the Thessalonians, I think this is a third time at least that he said that. Chapter 1, verse 2 says, We always thank God for all of you, making mention of you constantly in our prayers. And here in chapter 3, verse 9, he reiterates it again. But he says very earnestly. That's a word that means in a manner beyond the furthest degree. So we're talking intensely coming before God saying, allow us to be face to face so that we can encourage them the way that they've encouraged us. Night and day, consistent daily prayer. And it reveals just how intensely and consistently they've been praying for the church at Thessalonica. Are our prayers like that for our brothers and sisters at Lakeside? It shows how they're praying. But what are they praying for? He says to see you face to face. They want to be in person. So we see how they're praying and what they're praying for. But why are they praying that? Well, he says to complete what is lacking in your faith. To correct, to complete something here is to correct, to repair, to replace a part in order to put together what is broken. But it may not necessarily be broken. It could just be to improve the condition of something. The idea that it could be used if you were talking about, I need to mend the nets. The net could have been in good shape and then just got a few tears and just needed to be put back together. To complete what is lacking in your faith was the why. He wanted to make sure the Thessalonians continued and had the support for their faith to keep growing. So number three, faith always has room to grow. Brothers and sisters, I don't mean this as a discouragement, but your faith, my faith, is incomplete. So it needs to keep growing. And some of you have been in the faith for a long time. But keep growing. There's still room to grow. Some of you feel like you're doing really well right now in the faith. Praise the Lord. Keep growing. Don't coast. Some of us know we have a lot of room for growth, but that's also not a reason to give up or lose heart. Keep growing. There's room to grow. Warren Wearsby, a fantastic Bible commentator, writes, faith is like a muscle. It gets stronger with use. To this point, Paul does not seem to be correcting some significant error in the Thessalonian church. He understands the need for continued growth and godliness, period. The church has been commended to date through this letter that we've read so far. He says that they've done well because they followed the apostles' example. They've done well because they were a good example to others, even though they didn't know it. They've been turning from idols to the living God. They were waiting for Jesus to return from heaven. They were receiving God's word as just that, God's word. He's like, you're doing well, but I need, I desire to see you to help complete what is lacking in your faith because there's still room to grow. So keep growing brothers and sisters. And even the next two chapters, there's exhortation to holiness, to holy living, but it does not even still imply that the church was functioning in some sinful way. But he understands we need to keep growing. A story isn't finished. The work isn't done. And so in, in this earnest, intense, and consistent prayer, he, he says two things. He asks for two things. One, well, he thanks God. He thanks God for all the joy they've experienced because of their faith and love. And two, he prays for their faith to be made complete, to come to maturity, to be mended and strengthened. You know, when we pray for someone to get, grow in the faith, it might feel sometimes like we're asking God for patience. I've heard some of you say that. I've said this. You know, oh, I don't ask God for patience anymore. You know why? What, when you ask God for patience and he says yes, that means you're about to go through something 
that ain't a whole lot of fun. And to get the answer you want, you have to wait. We don't like waiting. We have microwaves for instant dinner. We have air conditioning for instant cool. We have heaters for instant heat. We, we have foot massagers for instant comfort on our feet. But we need to ask that God would grow us up, increase and complete what is lacking in our faith, no matter what that means, the answer is, because it's good for us. It's good for his kingdom, and it's for his glory. God's name is magnified and lifted high when he accomplishes these good works in us. So I ask you now, examine your own faith. Are you living out faith and love? Is it coming as a fruit of God's spirit working in you? Are you loving more than you did yesterday, last week, last year? Life's not a snapshot, so don't just take one day. But look at, look at the trajectory. Are you growing in faith and love? And would the people sitting around you agree would our church family recognize the growth that has taken place in us? Are we around each other enough? We need to be. Are we actually looking at each other and holding each other accountable in a loving, patient way? We need to be. Are you living fully for the Lord? Are you growing in your faith or are you coasting? I'm kind of tired of the energy it takes to grow. I'm going to I'm just going to coast for a while. You know what you do when you coast? You slow down. You go the opposite direction. There's no steady. You might not notice a difference for a little while. But eventually, your trajectory changes course. The goal now is not to feel guilty about not getting everything right. But it's about growing in the faith. Even if you have slidden backwards and you know that you have been rebellious and you're here this morning hearing this and you, you have a part of your soul going, yes, I want to go back to living fully for the Lord. I want that. But God knows what I've done. There's grace. And maybe he used this season in your life to actually shape you, to, to help you remember how much disgusting of a taste the the choices that we make that are against God, the rebellion against God is so distasteful. Maybe he's allowed us to go down that path to remember how much he's good. God is speaking today through his word. And his spirit enlightens our hearts and minds to know and understand his word. So I believe that the spirit of God is working even now as we have proclaimed the word of God and I think he's speaking to your hearts through what has been proclaimed. And I want to encourage you, don't quench the spirit. Don't stifle him and, and say, I'll, I'll deal with that tomorrow. Can I encourage you to deal with it right now? There's grace. Keep taking the healthy step forward. That's where health is. That's where life is. With Christ. I just want to encourage you to respond today. Normally I pray right now and the music team comes up, but I'm just going to ask the music team to come up. I want to invite you to respond to the Lord. As I don't want to take a break. I want to say if you want to come and kneel and pray and say, God, I've got to get right with you. I want to live fully for you the way I ought to. I want to say, just go ahead, let's have everybody stand. We're going to sing in a second. Anyway, would you stand? And if someone needs to get out, would you let them out? If you want me to pray with you, I'll be down front. We're going to start singing. But if you need to respond to the Lord, I urge you, listen and respond. It's worth it. Can't live without him. Thank you uh, for being part of our gathering this morning. I hope you have been encouraged in God's word and strengthened, ready to stand firm as we go out into the mission field. I pray that God will keep growing Lakeside Baptist Church. 
uh, let me conclude with prayer and I'll close with the benediction words in a moment, but let's pray. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your people. Thank you for bringing us together. And, and God, I pray you are honored by our gathering and not just in the moment of our gathering, but be honored in your people as we go out into our homes and communities, workplaces and hobby places. God, we need you. We need your strength. Help us to walk in truth, living fully for you. Help our souls to not be satisfied with anything but you. Cry out to you, Lord. And now may the Lord cause us to increase and overflow with love for one another and for everyone. May he make our hearts holy before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be all the glory and honor forever. Amen.